Welcome back to the 215th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including reservations from the Taiwanese people about America coming to defend them from China, the deflation spiral that China is going through, which could affect some factors about invading Taiwan, but also just talking about their economy and the wider impacts, and how the Artemis missions, the missions to land people on the moon, have been pushed back, and we need to maybe reevaluate them. And of course, we'll end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So there's been lots of contention around the bills that Biden and some other Democrats are proposing in order to get funding to Ukraine, Israel, and along with that, Taiwan. And there's, there's a whole bunch of internal domestic politics going around about that. But I want to focus in on the Taiwan funding. Is that something that we should focus on? Do you believe that we should be spending our money, our blood and treasure, as some people would say, over in Taiwan? Is that a worthwhile area to defend? I have my opinions, but I want to hear yours. Throw it down in the comment section, and hopefully there are some interesting opinions down there so we can start a conversation. So let's jump to our first article that comes from the New York Times. And yes, it is a bit of a chunky one. The headline reads, Taiwan's doubt about America are growing. That could be dangerous. So when we have this conversation about Taiwan, recently it's been covered in the way that they're talking about their recent elections. Is it going to be a more conciliatory conciliatory party that is more willing to negotiate with the Chinese, give in to their demands, or is it going to be a, a pro-Taiwan party that is there to defend the sovereign nation of Taiwan? And the people of Taiwan, they spoke. They wanted to remain independent of China. They had a more pro-Taiwan candidate this time that they put into office. And the good thing about that is that the Taiwanese people are going to stay resilient. They're showing that they do not want to go back to being a part of China. But they're also showing a little bit of reservation about the United States coming and defending them and being a part of that coalition in order to ward off China. And let's be clear, the United States has many great interests in Taiwan, let alone the, the chip industry, but also the fact that if China is able to take Taiwan, they're able to project their power into the uh, South Chinese Sea, uh, and then you may actually have an actualization of that, I believe it's the seven uh, dotted line that China puts on a lot of its maps, claiming the entire South China Sea to itself, which means they could have more influence over trade in the region. So... There are lots of interests here for the United States, but the time when these people are looking at what we're doing with Russia and with uh, Ukraine and then with Israel and how we've kind of backed down in some situations, we're not the most outright boisterous defenders in other situations, and they're kind of like, whoa, okay, hold on, U.S., are you really going to... Are you going to keep your promise here? And there's another scar, historically, that is sitting with the Taiwanese people, which we'll get into a little bit later into this article, because the author really emphasizes it, and I think that's because it sits very present in the Taiwanese people's minds, even though it was over 40 years ago. So let's go to the first few paragraphs of the article. Quote, now more than ever, the fraught psychology of that predicament is showing signs of wear, with China asserting its claim to the island with greater force and the United States increasingly divided over how active it should be in global affairs. Taiwan is a bundle of contradictions and doubts less about its own government's plan or even Beijing's than the intentions of Washington. So they go on to talk about the election here. Pre-election polling show that most people in Taiwan had stronger relationships despite the risk of provoking China. They support the recent rise in weapon sales from the United States. They believe President Biden is committed to defending the island, but they worry that it is not enough. So that's a really interesting and key point to this, which is no matter how much we say, no matter how much we argue, oh, yes, we're going to come to your defense, Taiwan. We're going to be on your side. We are going to help you against China. If the people don't believe us, 
that does not inspire optimism and confidence. And when you think about Taiwan versus China, not only are you talking about a massive, massive nation versus a tiny, tiny island nation, a massive military against a relatively small military, but you're also talking about the people. You're talking about what is the resiliency of those certain populations. And as we've seen, China has a very Russia-esque mentality, which is we can just throw people at it, especially with the amount of rearing and propaganda that has been talked about in China, where, no, Taiwan is just a breakaway province, province, and we will go and take them back. Almost everybody in the nation, and let's be clear, we only have a, a very particular view through which we can see China, and that is the Chinese Communist Party for the most part. So the view may be warped. Maybe more people aren't in support of Taiwan. But the rhetoric right now and the overwhelming opinion that's coming out of China is they are in support of getting Taiwan back. So that population more than likely will be able and willing to press on in order to achieve their goals, even if they lose a lot of people in the process. Whereas the Taiwanese people, they are adamantly independent. They do want to assure that they can keep their way of life and not be underneath the communist regime. So that's one compelling factor. But when they look at who's going to back them up, when they think about U.S. support and if it's going to dwindle, that can affect their resolve going into the war. They may be less optimistic. They may be less willing to keep on fighting and losing their own children because China has a larger population than Taiwan, so they can lose more people and have less of an effect on their overall economy, so on and so forth. So these are important factors when we're talking about whether or not Taiwan will actually be able to resist the Chinese Communist Party when it comes to attack and take over that little island that the U.S. treasures so much. So let's talk about where some of this distrust actually stemmed from, because it's not just some of the recent events it is in the past, too. Quote, the origins of Taiwan's distrust can't be glimpsed in a row of mildewing houses and in the mountains above skyscrapers of Taipei, the island's vibrant capital. Starting around 1950, American soldiers occupied these bungalows with their speckled floors and large yards. The troops' presence seemed permanent. There were about 9,000 American soldiers in Taiwan in 1971 when a treaty ensured that the United States would defend Taiwan against any attacker. Then, rapidly, they were gone. When the United States established diplomatic ties with the People's Republic of China in 1979 after President M Richard M. Nixon's visit to Beijing in 1972, it sped the departure of the American personnel. Neighbors recalled friends disappearing with toys and kitchen utensils left behind to rust. So, there argument here, what they're getting at is the global situation changed, the diplomatic position of the United States changed, and then they pulled out. They did not stay simply because they believed in Taiwan, because they had a treaty with Taiwan, because they had friends there in Taiwan. No, the situation changed. We opened up ties with the People's Republic of China. We saw it as a market. We saw it as an opportunity to grow our own market, move some manufacturing there, bring them into the world order, possibly take them out of communism, all of these different factors. But we worried about our own self-interest first. And, you know, I'm going to be fair to the Taiwanese people here and the United States. Uh, do you really blame them? The point of a nation is to look out for its citizens' best interests. It's, it is to protect them against enemies, domestic and foreign. But in this modern age where the state plays an even larger role in facilitating economic trade and so on and so forth, uh, yes, they're looking out for the economic benefit of their people, the geostrategic benefit of their people. Do you really want a communist China right there next to one of your allies in Japan? Uh, we didn't know India was that much of a going to be that much of an ally at that point, but we were still allies with uh, Australia. We still had some ties with the Philippines because of their uh, previous colonial nature to the United States. So there was lots of geopolitical influences there as well. So I don't think the Taiwanese people can necessarily be mad at the United States per, for pursuing their own best interests, just like I would hope the Taiwanese government pursues its own best interest. But I do feel bad for them. I, I do feel bad for the Taiwanese people because they felt as though this American presence was a bond of friendship, a bond of allyship 
And then these people left, and it left a scar on the psyche of a lot of older Taiwanese people, or people nowadays, they were probably 40 when it happened then, now they're probably 80 years old, or if they were 30, 20, 10 when that was happening, they're full-grown adults now, and they remember possibly having an American soldier family next to them with uh, their best friend being an American, they were playing with the toys in the backyard, and now they've left and that toy just sits there, lonely. And that person only looks back on the memories they had, and there's nobody there anymore. So you could see how this would affect the way they view the United States. They're saying, ah, okay, the United States is only going to look out for its best interest. So Taiwan's got to make it in the U.S.'s best interest. And the Taiwanese people are rightfully, rightly saying, okay, so if we fall out of America's best interest, does that mean that we're no longer going to expect them or can expect them to support us in this war, to save us from the Chinese party, the Communist Chinese party, who's going to try to take over our homeland? I, I think these are all valid questions, and I think that it's part of the conversation that we need to have. We are living in a world of strategic ambiguity. We are living in a world where the United States is saying, we will defend Taiwan, but we also believe in a one-state solution for the Chinese, Taiwanese people, so on and so forth, where it's a little bit wish-washy. It's a little bit of mixed talk, and you can't necessarily figure out where the U.S. stands on this. And Taiwan is saying, we want you to come out and say that we will defend Taiwan no matter what. If China invades, we will be there to defend against that invasion. And the U.S. is like, whoa, whoa, hey, partner, like we're with you, we're with you, but we can't come out outright and say that. I mean, we can't be that hostile with China because we still have economic interests there, manufacturing interests. The global market, even though it is diversifying, still for the most part passes through China, or at least some part of it does. A lot of our supply chains do. So we can't come out and be that outright hostile. And that is part of the issue with the global policy that we have gone after across the world. This isn't just the United States, where we have everything interlinked with one another. Every single country is dependent on each other for economic ties, and some more than others. But in these cases, large nations, even small nations, are hesitant to back up uh, certain allies or what they believe is right because there is a possible economic hit that could come along with it. And let's be clear, the economic benefits from this more free market on a world scale where we can have people in certain nations who are better at doing certain skills in certain jobs than people in other nations, yes, it allows each nation to have a comparative advantage and therefore lower prices, be able to have more competition. Yes, these are all great things. But also when it comes to foreign policy on the military front and defending our allies, it puts us in a pickle. And it's a serious question as to whether or not we should continue to develop economic ties with people that are obviously going to fight against our interests on the world stage. And it's we use economic warfare in order to determine the outcomes of some of these things, or at least try to deter some of the outcomes. But that's not always going to work when you have a nation like China that has a deep ideology and a deep, consistent worldview that Taiwan is a part of China and we can have no defection because the CCP, the Communist Party, is the ultimate end-all, be-all of China. There is no other China. And yes, they call Taiwan now, but it started as the democratic parties of China going to Taiwan. And we can have no other legitimate democracy opposing us for, quote-unquote, representing China, which is what some really hardliners in Taiwan are still calling for. So what else do we need to talk about here? I want to talk about the self-interest a bit a little bit more. Uh, because at the end of the day, we do have a interest in Taiwan as it is now, which is about, what, 90% of the world's chips are made in Taiwan. Uh, so let me actually go to a quote here that outlines some of the why some people are skeptical about the United States and their position going into the future. Quote, some of Taiwan's most vocal U.S. skeptics have learned not just from history, but also from personal experience. They have graduated. They were graduate students in New York during the COVID-19 pandemic, disillusioned by the chaotic response and anti-Asian pre prejudice. Others are engineers in Silicon Valley, 
who have connections and worry that Taiwan's microchip industry, which makes 90% of the world's most advanced semiconductors, will be weakened by pressure to manufacture in the United States and stealing the jewel that makes the world want to keep the island out of China's hands. They are also There are also immigrants like uh, Amy Chow, who runs a restaurant. She went back to vote in the most recent election, so on and so forth. So w- what am I trying to get at by bringing this one right here? In bringing up this quote, I'm trying to highlight that America does have a vested interest in Taiwan, but also we are diversifying away from Taiwan. I think the anti-Asian uh, hate kind of segment of that was a little bit of BS. The the uh, Maybe there are some people who did genuinely see people hate on Asian people because of coronavirus, but I think a lot of it more was targeted at China rather than Asian people altogether. And even then, I wouldn't call it hate. I would call it legitimate facts, whether or not you think the COVID disease came from one location or another inside China, it came from China. So if there were different policies in China, maybe it could have been stopped. That, that would be a legitimate framework to view things through, but that's besides the point. The idea that, yes, America is diversifying, we're actually bringing some of the manufacturer of chips back here. Yes, we're trying to secure our strategic interests. But guess what? Taiwan did the exact same thing in those deals. It actually made sure that the fabs that are being built here are about one or two generations behind what they currently have in Taiwan to in order in order to secure their strategic advantage and their comparative advantage, not only economically, but also on a geopolitical sphere. They're saying, okay, yeah, you can have two generations ago, but if you want the most up-to-date thing, if you want to be able to produce the most up-to-date chips with the smallest and most advanced process, guess what? You're going to have to do it here in Taiwan. So when Taiwanese people are like, well, America's only looking out for their best interests, so is Taiwan. That's the whole point of every single nation. And if you... And this may sound really selfish, and this may sound very Americanistic, uh, nationalistic, or uh, you know, American supremacist. But as long as you offer something of worth to us, we will be there. Now, is the there's multiple things beyond economics that are worth it to us. One, we don't want China to have over to to be able to reach their hand over the South China Sea and control all of the trade that goes through the region. That is economic, but is also ideological. We don't want them to have too much power on the global shipping network and the global economy. But also there is one more, which I think plays a very, very big role, which is we want Taiwan to succeed as one of the only democracies in the region. That is an amazing symbol not only for other people in the region to look at Taiwan and say, hey, look, Taiwan's doing it. Taiwan's been able to do it for this long. They were able to implement democracy. We don't have to have an authoritarian ruler. We don't have to have a semi-communistic state. We don't have to bow underneath this religious monarch, so on and so forth. We can have a democratic system. It works in Taiwan. It works in Japan, even though theirs is a little bit different. It's a little bit more complicated in Japan. But The point is, it's an amazing symbol. And it's not just a symbol for Asia, but also for America, which is saying, look at this democracy. It is thriving. It is producing amazing goods. It has survived against the torments of a Chinese regime who absolutely wants them destroyed. This is the power of democracy. And this is what we brought into the region. And we're going to back it up because they hold a similar worldview, or at least a similar political system and a similar worldview to us. So just like the Chinese Communist Party has an ideology that Taiwan is meant to be a part of China, and that can inspire their people forward, there's also the idea that democracy is thriving in Taiwan, and the United States can use that as a, I don't want to say bulwark, but it can use that in order to rile up support across the world. Why do you think the Ukraine and Russia narrative was put forward as a democracy versus an authoritarian rule by uh, Vladimir Putin? Because that message resonates. Why do you think when Israel is brought up in the Middle East, it is one of the only democracies that they keep hammering this point home? This sort of argument resonates with the American people. And it will resonate with other democracies around the world who truly believe their way of governing is the best. And that is ideological. And ideology can take you a lot further than simple economic 
cost-benefit analysis when you want to play on people's hearts and emotions rather than their pure logic. So I think the Taiwanese people, yes, they, their skepticism is warranted, but I also believe that at the end of the day, uh, the United States will be there at least for the first half. And then after that, we may leave it to them, and, and we'll see when that little shine and veneer of the democracy argument goes away. But I truly believe in my heart that we should defend Taiwan. Now, am I a person who would give up my life for another nation? I probably No, I would say no, but maybe there's the small exception that that is the case. But I'm sure that enough people will support this and at least want to give them material support that it may not have to come to us actually putting our boots on the ground. And I wouldn't agree with that necessarily, putting American soldiers at risk for another country. Now, if China was outright attacking us, that's a different situation, but they're not going to do that. They're not going to declare war on the United States uh, unless they feel as though their right to Taiwan is truly threatened by U.S. participation and support, just like Mr. Uh, Adolf did during World War Two and said, okay, hey, you're supporting our enemy, the British, we're going to declare war on you. Maybe that, that is a possibility, but I believe material support will be something that the American people can get behind no matter what. And I think that we should, personally. So let's jump to another article talking about China that comes from Business Insider. The headline reads, China's rapidly dwindling future will shape the world for decades to come. So I have talked about this bubble that existed in the Chinese economy before. And it is really based around housing. They had rapidly built up cities in the middle of nowhere. They had rapidly built up new apartments that people were buying, and they saw it as a form of investment because these prices just kept going up and up. And instead of having a savings account, some people had a second or even a third apartment in order to guarantee that they could make money off of it from rent or they could sell it in the future in order to make a pretty penny. Well, now we're starting to see deflation in the economy, and it's not just based on the real estate slash housing market, but it's based on other things as well. So let's take a step back and go to the first quote where they describe the situation, and then I can get into why this deflation that they're dealing with is actually getting locked in because of the housing situation they had in the past. Quote, the country's growth has been treated like an inevitability for decades. This is referring to China, of course. Everything was getting bigger. Its cultural influence, geopolitical ambition, population, and seemed poised to continue until the world was remade in China's image. The foundation for this inexorable rise was its booming economy, which allowed Beijing to throw its might around in other areas. But now China's economy is withering, and the future Beijing imagined is being cut down to size along with it. The clearest sign, and this is the next paragraph, I want to keep on going here so we can get an even broader sign of the economic troubles in China. The clearest sign of this diminishment is China's worsening deflation problem. While Americans are worried about inflation or prices rising too fast, policymakers in Beijing are fretting because their prices are falling. The consumer price index has declined for the past three months, the longest deflationary streak since 2009. In a race for global economic supremacy, deflation is an albatross around Beijing's neck. It's a sign that Chinese economic model has well and truly run out of juice and that a painful restructuring is required. But beyond the financial problems, the sinking prices are signs of deeper malaise gripping the Chinese people. So you may be thinking, okay, hold on, what's the big inf problem with deflation? And what's the problem with deflation in the housing market? So problem with deflation, number one, is in order to stimulate the economy, in order to get people to come out when prices are continually falling. Uh, well, okay, let's take a step back. The there was a equal amount of supply and demand. Let's suppose that's where we start here. And supply has stayed steady. Every single business is still producing the exact same amount. And the demand, for some reason, whether it was artificially suppressed during COVID or government policies or anything like that, people are saying, okay, hey, uh, you know, honestly, I'm not going to go out and spend for that. Uh, I'm going to say bread because I, I love the one of bread. I'm not going to go buy that loaf of bread for $12. So the person who's selling the bread says, okay, hold on, you don't want to buy it for $12? It's okay, it's okay. 
I will sell it to you for $11. And then when we see this across an economy where the suppliers are staying steady and the demand is lower and they're trying to entice those people who, or those are the consumers, the people that demonstrate what the demand is, they're trying to entice those consumers to come out so they lower their prices. When you have this continually, when you have this across an economy, this is deflation because demand is much lower than the supply and the people that are selling are trying to say, okay, hey, 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 I want you to come out and buy my products or we're going to cut the price. It's an incentive to get them out there. So this is an issue when it happens across the entire economy because guess what? As employers start to cut their prices, they don't necessarily have enough to pay wages. So certain people are getting uh, thrown off the, the ticket. They're getting thrown out of their job because these these sellers have to limit the amount of costs that go into getting that bread to market. And then you see other issues, which is, okay, people are saying, oh, well, hey, why would I have to go, if you see this systemically, if deflation is happening for a long time, people are like, well, that loaf of bread, I, you know, I don't really need it this week. And it was $12 two weeks ago, and it's $10 now. Maybe it will be $8 in, in another two weeks or $9 next week. Maybe I could just buy it then. So there's a little bit of hesitancy to save money. So a lot of people are holding their money out of the economy. So how does this link back to the housing issue? Well, one, since the bubble kind of collapsed a little bit and these ever-rising housing prices, they're starting to go down, there's two things happening. One, the people who have these houses are trying to sell very quickly because they want to lock in that value that they gained before it goes below the price that they paid for it. So there's a large supply of housing. And then the other side of it, the demand side, it's exactly like the loaf of bread. They're looking at these housing prices and they're saying, well, you know, it was $100,000 for that apartment last year. Now it's $60,000. Maybe it will be $50,000, $40,000 in another year. So they're doing this math and they're saying, oh, no, we'll, we'll hold off for now. We're going to keep our money out of this and buy at a better time when things kind of bottom out. Now, nobody's going to actually know when it bottoms out. And if they buy it at 40000 that's still probably a lot cheaper than the person who's selling it now initially sold it for. But there's hesitation to get into the housing market because they think that prices are going to continually go down. So it's not actually a good investment. And as we mentioned earlier, Chinese people view, or at least for the past few years, have viewed these housing operations as an investment. But also, it is causing these people who do have the supply, some of them are just saying, okay, well, then I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sell. There are a large amount of them that are going to try to sell and get their monies back. But some of them are saying, okay, hey, this is this is pointless. We're we're not going to sell. We'll just let our housing value continue to drop. So you're seeing a lot of different factors here that are leading to this malaise. And the reason that this is going to be an issue is because at the end of the day, it's going to devalue the power, the purchasing power, the purchasing power parity, which is uh, goods in one country for goods in another. So now for people to buy, if you're in the United States, in order to buy 100 bushels of Chinese wheat, it used to be $100,000. Now it's $50,000. And the U.S. businessman said, could say, well, you know, I, my budget was $100,000, so now I can buy 200 bushels. Or they can say, well, but I only need that 100 bushel, and now I'll buy it at $50,000. So some people are taking advantage of the lower prices on outside markets and people that would want to invest, they're saying, well, my investment isn't going to actually go up. If I buy a thousand dollars in stock in a, a company that's based in China and they have to continually cut their prices and their margins are getting thinner and thinner, how am I going to guarantee that I got a return on my income? So it's hard to encourage people to, from the outside of China to bring money in and possibly demand. So you can see how this is a downward spiral. And this is going to put pressure on China because they're also having a declining population. This is going to put pressure on them to go and take Taiwan. And one thing the author says is, hey, okay, sorry, I'm moving on from Taiwan a little bit, but I thought it was an interesting point. The author says, well, the Chinese economy, they could just, you know, the government could just stimulate things by giving out stimulus checks and encouraging people to spend it. But that is actually against Xi Jinping's ideology. He just doesn't want to hand out money 
to people, and he believes that it is not a good thing. He doesn't want to fall into the same problems that the West has, where their government and their economies just keep throwing out stimulus money here or there. So he's tr- it's ideolo- ideological why he's not actually doing something that could possibly fix this issue. So what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to restructure just like Dep- Japan did for practically 25 years after their crash in the 90s if this continues at this rate. And I don't necessarily think that government intervention is a good thing, but I also do agree that in this case, it's very hard to get people to come out of savings mode unless you keep taking your prices down. And when you have a artificially created bubble by the government, a direct intervention by the government to encourage people to build more houses and buy more houses, this is a government created problem. Should the government get the people out of it? That's a mixed bag on that one. I don't necessarily think they should like on a pure government getting involved in people's lives situation, but it also is a problem caused by the government. It was also caused by the way that these building companies structured their building operations, which is instead of taking the money from the people and building, they actually pre-sold some of these apartments and then use that money to build the building. So instead of building the building and then selling, what they did is they sold and then built the building, which means that they were actually dependent on those people coming through and paying for the apartments. And then the people were also dependent on the companies actually being able to put up those apartments that they had pre-purchased. So then when one of those two things fails, the system, kind of like a Ponzi scheme, because the money is there before anything's actually being used for. And sometimes they would do this with two apartment buildings ahead. They said, okay, hey, we're going to have this great location in three years. They take the money that they're getting for the pre-approved apartment uh, rentals or purchases for the building in two years and putting it towards the building they're building right now. So it's been a system that has not uh, encouraged faith, let's say that way. And now we're starting to see it bite the Chinese people and the Chinese government in the butt. So let's jump to our last article. It will be a very quick one. It comes from the Daily Wire, and the headline reads, Challenges persist in getting astronauts to the moon. NASA again delays launch date. So the, the reason this is also in here is because Uh, The Artemis missions are extremely important to get, and this is the NASA's program, in order to get a moon base up there and then also get people on that moon base. The reason I really wanted to put this in this specific podcast is because the Artemis teams are pushing themselves to be the first ones there because of competition from other nations, such as, guess what? Wait, hold on, hold on. What is the theme been of this one? Who do you think I'm going to say? Ah, yes, China. So the questions are starting to arise. Is it actually practical? Because they push back the dates for both the Artemis, they push back the dates for Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. But people are worried that getting people up there for Artemis 3 is going to be unfeasible and that the United States is trying to stretch itself thin in order to beat China. And are we putting our people at risk in order to simply be better than a different nation? And it's a very interesting argument. It's also a it's a pretty simple but interesting article. I would go and read it. I'm sorry I'm not going to get into it a little bit more, but I don't want to go on for an hour and a half. I think uh, 33, 35 minutes is a pretty good length for some of these podcasts. So if you want to read that article, there's a link in the description below, the like and subscribe button. And from here, let's jump into our daily delight. That's something I don't cut short because I do want you to leave with a positive point of view or at least a little bit of positivity in your heart. So the headline for this one, which comes from Inside Edition, Adorable Husky Tries to Free Dogs in Animal Shelter. So yes, somehow this husky got out of his cage, and guess what? He's going around, he's like, hey, Jimmy, yeah, 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 I got you, man. I'm going to undo your latch too. And he's absolutely going through the entire animal shelter trying to get everybody else out, and a police officer shows up, and he's like, whoa, what the what the heck happened here? Have they been robbed? And then he sees oh, all the dog food's down. It's like, oh, no, it, it was a dog that actually got out. So if you want to see this cute video and see all the reactions and the dog, you know, trying his best to help out his friends, or like I mentioned earlier, read any of today's articles, there is that link in the description below the like and subscribe button. Also down there is the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, as well as Podvine. And the Twitter handle at Your Daily Flip, where I post a Twitter tirade every Tuesday and Thursday. With all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.